last uh, week. Now it sounds like a long time ago because I know you are focused on finite difference right now. So we have been looking at finite volume scheme to solve uh, uh, the simplest type of conservation loss, scalar conservation loss, which means just uh, one variable in one dimensional space. So there is only x. We are going to go into system of conservation laws pretty quickly next lecture. And we are also going to go to two dimensions, and which is practically the, the same as three dimensions, uh, also either next lecture or the lecture after that. All right. So, so today we are going to be talking about still, we are still in the realm of scalar conservation laws. Does everybody know what it means by a scalar conservation law? Okay, a scalar conservation law just means we are solving for one unknown as opposed to several unknowns. In our finite difference project everybody is working on, we are solving for two unknowns, P and Q. Right? They are they are two they are coupled system of equations. You can't just solve for P without solving for Q. Right? one variable of space and time. So it's a scalar conservation law in that sense. It is opposed to a system of conservation laws when we have several variables of space and time and they depend on each other. They have to be solved concurrently. Okay, so we are looking at the type of equation partial u partial t plus partial f of u partial x is equal to zero. And u is one variable. In system of conservation laws, it's exactly the same except for u is a vector, is uh, several variables. And f of u is also a function of several variables. It's, f of u is going to be a multivariate function of several variables. Okay, so that's the difference. Here f is a scalar function of one single variable. Okay, and in finite difference, we are up to now, we have been using a piecewise constant approximation. In finite volume, we are storing the function u as a function of x. We are not storing the function except for the averages of the function over each finite volume. So we are splitting the spatial domain into small volumes. And we are storing the average of the solution within each volume. Right, so let's say this is the average. And so far, we have been using these averages as it is. We are using these averages as if these averages are the value of the function within that interval. Later today, we are going to do something better than that approximation. But like, let's first review what we have done last lecture. We have, think, we have been thinking this is what the function looks like. It's piecewise constant. And what we need to do is we need to compute the flux at these discontinuous boundaries, right? At the common interface of two adjacent volumes, the function is discontinuous. And in the last lecture, we studied the good enough numerical flux, which is saying what is the flux at the same discontinuity, let's say this is i, i plus 1, then the discontinuity is, then the interface is denoted as i plus half. It is the good enough flux zooms into this region, let's say put a magnifying glass into this region and look at that discontinuity and ask the question, if I'm solving this equation exactly, Okay, if I'm evolving this discontinuity forward in time for infinitesimal amount of time, how is the discontinuity going to look like after infinitesimal time? And also, what is the flux? What is the exact value of the flux after infinitesimal amount of time? And that flux is the good enough flux. Okay, let's draw this over here. So red is at time zero, and blue is at time zero plus epsilon. So let's say if the solution goes over here, 
then the value of the flux, of course, is the F evaluated at U left. And if the whole thing moves to, to the left, the value of the flux is F evaluated at U R. Right? And the good on the flux figures that out, and we had four different scenarios for the Burgess equation. And in this lecture, we are going to we are going to put these four scenarios together into only two scenarios. So these four scenarios we have been talking about is actually only two scenarios are. The four scenarios, let's review what, that, what the four scenarios are last lecture. The four scenarios are, one scenario is both the UL, the characteristic speed at both UL and UR or DFDU at UL and UR, uh, they are both greater than zero. Or information or the wave at both sides are moving towards which direction? Actually, for you, it's towards the right, right? OK, then we know it is exactly this case. The second scenario is when both the characteristics are less than zero, they are moving towards your left. And in that case, we know also f is just the f of ur, right, because things are going towards the left. What is exactly on the interface a moment later is ur. And the, uh, the case three and case four are when the f u are of different signs. If the FDU on the left is so if if the FDU at the U left is greater than zero, greater than the FDU at right, what happens? If left goes right and right goes left, they are kind of colliding to each other. What happens in that case? Yes, it is going to keep, the discontinuity is going to be kept as a shock. And what decides if the shock moves towards the left or towards the right? Yeah, which one is stronger or the speed of the shock? It's delta F over delta U in that case. So if that is the case, we are going to decide, we are going to decide the direction of the shock according to delta F over delta U, right? OK, good. So if delta F over delta U is positive, then we are going to, the shock is moving towards the right, towards the right, and we are taking the left value to evaluate the flux. Otherwise, we are taking the right value to evaluate the flux. The fourth case, or final case, or the tricky case, is also, DFDU has different signs, but they are flipped over. What happens in that case? The flux is zero. And what is special about zero? Why zero? If I, if I go to some other than Burgess equation, would it also be zero? Yeah? If, if my f of u is u squared over 2, that's Burgess equation, plus 100, which would never be zero. OK, would I, what would the flux be at when, when this is the case? Hmm? What constant? 100? Good, that's, that's the right guess. But why 100? It's f of 0. And what is special about f of 0? Right, first of all, the fact that I added 100, if you take it into this equation, it doesn't modify the equation at all, right? It's a constant taking derivative, it's gone. So you are right, the flux at, at this point should be 0. But why 0? Because 0 is the point where the characteristic switches from 
going towards the left and going towards the right. Right? This f of u, if you take look at f as a function of u, it's like this. And this is 0. On the left of 0, the characteristics goes towards the This is the point of the minimum of this f. It is the minimum because it separates the up going slope and right going slope of, of this function f. OK, so if that is the case, then my flux value should be the value of the f at the minimum point, or at the point where the slope of f switches from negative to positive. Does that make sense? Any questions about this special case? All right. So let me, OK, lo, let me generalize this flux function we have been talking about to the most general case. 